few months, and before that I worked for five years as a uh, Minister of Youth and Young Families at the Presbyterian Church in Canada. So a little representation yeah. here. Woo. Hometown. Um, I moved to Canada as a 13-year-old, became a Christian at 15, and uh, I call it stumbling after Jesus ever since. And um, the past 15 years, my life is immersed in youth ministry, and uh, I've never left, and you'll see by what I'm sharing today why. Um, I went from uh, being a youth group junkie, getting to any and every youth event possible, um, to being a um, Bible college student, to a volunteer youth worship leader, to a Bible college intern, to a uh, newbie pastor, and now I'm an assistant pastor, and my goal is basically to create a youth ministry which I can then remove myself from and get it um, self-moving. So it's a big task, and I'll share the journey of trying that as a task today. Um, the foundation of my talk, and I was sorry I couldn't be here this morning, I had to commute, and um, from Cornwall, that's a four-hour commute. So. Um, if anybody mentioned, did anybody talk about youth culture, like the shift and change in youth culture at all? Okay, so I'm sure you all know it's, ch it's changing rapidly, and um, specifically youth culture is changing more rapidly than even the adult culture, and um, our churches and ministries are stuck grasping and trying to keep up, and um, what we have is basically youth ministry now isn't an identity tailspin, I call it. Um, the old models don't work, people are trying to write new things, trying to come up with new ideas, trying to figure out what in the world is going to help reach kids for Christ. And um, I, I know you're here because you're here, you like a challenge, because we are dealing with the most rapidly changing culture and the most rapidly changing generation in a culture that the world, probably the world has ever seen. And uh, that is a challenge, and um, we have to be up to that. And it's no easy task. And, sad part is we often feel alone, so I'm going to talk about ways to not feel so alone as well. Um, resources are there, and you guys know, as well as I, that's already been mentioned since I've been here, that Matt Wilkinson's put out an amazing resource for us to understand, and we contributed to it, what is happening in the CBO Group Church, and how now, and, and leading forward, what to do. Um, there's also been um, another one put out by Canadians, the State of Youth Ministry in Canada, um, the, I think it's Evangelical Church can put out Hemorrhaging Faith. Have you guys heard of that one? And I think that one, because it's um, also put out by uh, a magazine or whatever, a community that older church people look at and listen to, that can be a really good talking point for your full congregation to say that, look, this is the reality. If the body of Christ in Canada was a full body, we have two gangrenous legs and we need to heal. And um, so it's a really good talking point, and the, the title and the word hemorrhaging pretty much sums it up. And we have to be able to speak with that kind of intensity, um, not to be negative, but to get attention. And, um, and what I want to share is that the positive side is we are here today, and despite all this change, tenaciously youth ministries are carrying on, and some of them very successfully, discipling kids, helping them grow in their faith, building community, even saving lives in the sense that kids today are getting suicidal, they're dealing with all kinds of identity issues, high-risk behaviors. Youth ministries, without even knowing it, sometimes save lives, and I've had that since come back to me, people saying that, you know, I was suicidal, I was close to this, and you guys helped steer my life. And uh, so it's amazing to know that as this change is happening, as hard as things are, we're hanging on, we're, we're not giving up, and that needs to be key. Um, I hope that sets the stage. We're in a whirlwind, and tons of stuff are going on under the surface of our culture. So what is the key to relating that youth ministry reality with the greater congregation? That's, that's kind of where we're he heading. And I want to do three uh, scenarios for you. The first one here is called the partition model. It, you might have known it as the Mickey Mouse hat if you've done Youth Ministry 101. Uh, Mark DeVries, I think, is the creator of this. He basically said, most youth ministries are a bubble on the side of the church where all the youth go and do the youth stuff and they aren't very involved in church life. They aren't very well known or recognized and uh, they get to do all their youth-like things in that context but they don't really have a place in the actual church body so they end up looking like a Mickey Mouse here and being their own little church inside, inside the church. Sharing, obviously, resources. Sharing 
um, usually a building, that sort of stuff. But directly, they don't have the full church kind of interacting with them. Um, just a question, if, just raise your hand just to see who I'm talking to directly and who I'm talking to directly. Your church, would you consider it a multi-generational or intergenerational church? Just by show of hands. <coughs> Hmm? Yeah, so it's not specific, like you're not a young adult focused church, and you're not a, because that, that's, if you're in a forward thinking church, that's pretty typical now, is we aim at Generation X people, we aim at, you know, young adults, or whatever it is. So most people here are still in a multi, or inter, intergenerational um, church. And this model happens a lot in that church because the main body says the needs of those people are different than ours, so let's set them up with their own leaders, their own small budget their own stuff. Um, you also might hear, since you're in this context, the cliches. So I'll give you some, um, hopefully you've heard them too. Um, we want the younger people involved. So you've heard that one? Show of hands. We want the younger people involved. Uh, we want to see them. You have heard that one? Um, what's the next one here? Um, <clears throat> um, be an usher. They could be an usher. <laughs> that one, you've heard that. Um, they can do a skit, have them ready for this morning. <laughs> that was epic in my last church. It was always like, where's the youth? I have a skit for this morning. And it was like, don't do it. <laughs> um, the last thing a youth wants to do is go up and do a bad job presenting someone to a bunch of adults. It's just not good business. Um, you've probably heard uh, they can use it, but make sure they bring it back and don't break it. Um, just make sure they don't blank in the sanctuary and you can fill in the blank. <laughs> um, yep. This one that really bugs me, and anytime I hear somebody say it, I actually like well up inside. Uh, please keep them quiet. And I was like, noise in a church is a good thing. If you want quiet, go to the library. We want noise. We want people engaging. We want conversations. Of course, there's times for quiet, but in general, that's a positive sign that your church has a vibrancy in it if there's noise. Um, but regardless of the cliche, and I want you here to hear this, all those cliches come from the same message. Um, just fit the youth into what we are already doing. Just fit the youth into what has always been done. Um, and they don't see this cultural shift um, that's happened in youth ministry. And the sad truth is, it's been happening for 40 years. And, uh, probably even more longer, but it's happened significantly in 40 years. And I actually had a conversation last night with the chair of our deacons committee, um, and he said that when he was a teenager in the 60s, a lot of these cliches were starting because the youth were saying, don't trust anybody over 30. And that, that, that one sentence, he believed, even as a Christian teenager, and it was actually quite a big divide for people that long ago. And it was amazing to hear um, youth culture has been separating for that long, and that's not a new issue. <clears throat> so, and my personal story is when I started at Trinity in Canada, um, I guess about six years ago now, six and a half years ago, um, I was hired to rebuild the youth ministry from nothing, and I didn't know what a partition, I never heard of this before at that time, but I quickly found out that I was the youth guy, and if there was youth to be taken care of, that was my job, and I did that, and there's not really much else for me to do in the church or the church to work with the youth. And uh, what happened basically for the most part is my wife and I built a relational youth ministry. Um, if you guys had to say your model of youth ministry is relational, can you raise your hand? That's like your main focus is you build relationships with kids. Yeah. So we did that and at the time we had no children and um, lots of time, lots of energy. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of passion to see these kids grow. And the relational model works. And that's one easy, positive thing I say. If you're being relational with kids, you will have success in a limited way with your teens. You'll build a very good youth group with those kids that you can be relational with. But you can only be relational with so many people and have them know that you care. We all have our limits. Um, so basically what happened in this is we developed, we did all the youth relational things. We had them over to our house. We went and did fun things together. We made identities for our youth group. We had um, all the different retreats and missions trips and traditions that we built. Um, the zombie thing. Um, we did every retreat. We did all the free time. The kids would make a horror, like a, a B-rated horror movie. That was kind of their 
they're funny things. I have related to your, they connect through doing silly things together, but you can always relate it back to Christ, and that's, that's the neat thing. Um, so the partition model, we did the relational thing, but what I started to see is when I wanted to do more with the youth and have the church come alongside and see and support them, I saw that it was very quickly, this was like talking French to people in Western Ontario. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it was just wasn't in their brains. They didn't understand. You're the youth guy, you're the youth stuff. And that was the, what I was getting. And what I was trying to say is, I'm youth guy. Listen to what I'm saying about the youth stuff because you need to be a part of it. And um, <clears throat> I even tried to bring youth, like, you know, I initially want to help the church and they, those cliches were said. And I, okay, I'll try. And every time I tried to pull kids into the ex existing church, they would just either um, grumble and complain, leave, just stop coming as often, or um, just get embarrassed and, you know, feel that. And so none of those worked. So I quickly learned my lesson not to, um, in this model, just constantly try to bring the youth ministry artificially into the church structure. Um, the next model that we talk about is the division model, and that's, I don't think anybody raised their hand, um, or didn't raise their hand, but is anybody in a youth church or a young adult church or anything like that here? Anybody? No. Okay. So if I speak negatively about this, someone's going to get offended. Um, uh, youth Ministry 3.0 is a book Mark Iaconelli put out, and he basically said youth culture now forms tr in significant tribes, and they talked about all the different characteristics of these tribes, that either be skaters or a certain type of music, or they all they revolve around a certain thing, and they, they gather. And uh, you joke about this, but then you could see, you could start a skater church, and they could all, the skaters could come together and have church around that hobby of skating, or the jock church, the glee club church. And sadly, it goes sound silly, but in Ottawa, there's the bikers church. If you guys know about Ottawa, they have a motorcycle church now. And um, there's a church for 20-somethings called My Church, and uh, it really focuses on that age group and not much else. And in Cornwall, right now, there's a youth church started and it focuses on youth, and they're very um, segregated. So if you took the tribe mentality and the segregation mentality, you'd have things start having things like a uh, twenty somethings, um, you know, rock group church, or you'd have a thirty somethings busy parents church, or you'd have the uh, overworked mom, soccer moms, and stressed out high tech dads church. Like it would just get to the obscurity. And uh, you can't completely divide just because you like something. And, and we have to try to teach that to um, our youth sometimes when they want, like, why don't we just go and do this and jump out and, and do a new radical church thing. And it isn't always the best idea. And some people feel a calling to go and reach a certain demographic. And you have to find very carefully um, where you're going with that. Um, we see youth and young, young adult churches attracting youth in an incredible way. Um, we see it happening. Does that mean it's the best model? We don't know, and we can't we can't say one way or the other. But when you look to Scripture, you see um, stuff like Romans 12, where it says each of us has one body with many members, and those members do not have the same function. So in Christ, though many, we form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, and that just that mentality. We're all together for a reason. Let's figure out how we can best serve Christ where we are, and not necessarily divide. Um, so division, that's another model. I'm not totally against it 100%, but I don't think it fits in our congregations because that means splitting away and not relating as much with the people. And the final one is called the encompassing model. And uh, Ryan's actually talking about family ministry after me, and uh, that's pretty much the first structured um, Offering that you can think of that has an encompassing model at the heart and basically is is that Each of the different main groups has some connection with youth ministry not to pull them into their structure, but to create um, Something for the youth In a holistic way where everybody's on board. Everybody's doing something um, Matt's talked a lot about that in his book about coaching and about having mentors and significant people having those five people relating to your youth Encompassing model is really um, us advocating the whole church to, instead of pulling the youth in, getting them up front, vis visible, that we instead 
come around the youth and ask them what their passions are, help them see their gifts, what they could do for the body of Christ, how they can reach the friends, and help them do that as a church. And um, some of the grounds for that, I just want to say, is like um, the closest mission field, if you will, and the older people will really relate to this because they're all about missions a lot of the time. Your closest mission field of people who don't have exposure to the gospel, don't have exposure to um, any faith probably at all, are the teens in your community. It's gotten that far that most teens in your average high school have very little exposure to faith in Christianity. It's mostly they see it in pop culture as jokes and as things that they never really get explained. So if you can explain to your congregation that um, that's actually the youth of our culture have less Christian exposure than most places where you send missionaries, and most places where you send money and prayers. That is an intense eye-opener, I think, for some of them to realize that right in our own backyards is, a, is an unreached people group, so to speak. I don't like thinking of them like that. But older generations see that, and they hear that, and they can relate in those terms. Um, so you can basically say well, all we really have to do is, is, as a whole church, do things to show young people that we love them and that we care about them and that they can see God's love through us. And uh, this idea is not fully functioning, but family ministry has a lot of things to start that, that, that it's the whole church's responsibility to raise people, especially in their teen years, as they become ready to be adults. And uh, so I can hand it over pretty quickly, but I do want to tell you um, just the story of a Trinity and how it kind of went. And relational ministry is great, but it has its limits. And unless the church is, is willing to encompass the youth ministry, you're only going to get so far. And um, my wife and I, we developed a really awesome youth ministry. We loved the kids. We had 40 youth by the third year we were there. It was awesome. And God was doing great things. But when I went to the church and said, we have so many youth coming, we need the church of 100, it was 150 people about to come around these youth and make this a priority. They just didn't understand how, and they didn't understand what that meant. And I tried to, as fast as I could explain it, but we weren't, like, having 40 youth, you guys know when you have a group, youth are high needs, and we actually got to the point, we were, my wife and I were counseling parents of a child in our home who had never come to the church. So it was like, we were doing marital counseling for a couple older, it just got bizarre, because there were so many needs in our youth group. And uh, we cried out to the church, but they weren't ready. So I think before you, as you're building, as you're starting youth ministries, as you're gaining that, ask your church to come around and find ways to do that. And uh, that's one of my, my I kind of have discussion questions. I don't know if I can throw them out to end. We can do our discussion time. Um, the three uh, discussion questions is, um, we're all leading youth groups in some shape or form, and they're carrying on, and some of the things we're doing are really being successful. So. Uh, maybe share with each other as we go into groups, what are the things that you're doing that you find them success in? Um, the second one is, how are you maintaining health in your youth ministry? Um, when you get tired and burnt out, who's there to back you up? And uh, that's a good place to ask for prayer too, is where do you need people to support you in prayer? And the other one is, can you think of ways in which your church can encompass your youth ministry, come around you, encircle the youth, because they are, and I even, even your Christian teens, and this is a part that I try to help my congregation see, even our Christian teens are still making up their mind about Jesus, if, even if they've committed or not. They're still um, searching, and it's a very important time to constantly be giving them um, vision about who they are, their identity in Christ, what that means to follow Christ into adulthood. And university is that we've seen as a cultural drop-off point. How are they going to take that leap into university and maintain their faith? You, can't, you have to have that conversation before they, they head off. And so, uh, that would be my um, end of that, and I hope you can have some good discussion on those questions.